Hello everyone. This presentation will be a broad overview of birth asphyxia. I'll be recording a separate topic on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in detail. But the aim of this presentation is to give a brief overview on birth asphyxia with regard to the definitions, the incidence, the risk factors and the treatment as a whole. Perinatal asphyxia or birth asphyxia broadly is defined as an impaired gaseous exchange during the perinatal period as a result of which leading to hypoxia, hypercarbia and acidosis. There are two widely regarded definitions for perinatal asphyxia. One is defined by the ACOG that is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the AAP definition which is by the American Academy of Pediatricians. The AAP definition of perinatal asphyxia is defined as a triad of three components cord umbilical artery pH less than 7 with a base deficit of more than 10 milli equivalents per liter, neonatal neurological manifestation of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and evidence of multi-system dysfunction. The ACOG definition comprises of cord umbilical artery pH less than 7, an additional component of APGAR score of 0 to 3 for more than 5 minutes and the other two points remaining the same namely being neonatal neurological manifestations of HIE and multiple organ involvement. Now coming to the etiology of perinatal asphyxia, the factors which increase the risk include any factor which can cause impairment of maternal oxygenation. This could be systemic causes as well as local causes. Local causes such as uterine artery uh, abnormalities, uh, increased hypertension, increase in blood pressure of the mother or any uh, respiratory cause which results in decreased saturation to the mother. Decreased blood flow from the mother to the placenta decreased blood flow from the placenta to the fetus, impaired gaseous exchange across the placenta or an increased fetal oxygen requirement. Now if you do consider each of these factors, the maternal factors include hypertension which could be acute or chronic, it could be because of hypotension, it could be because of infection, it could be because of chorioamnitis and it could also be because of uh, in utero exposure to certain drugs such as cocaine. Now, Placental blood flow will be impaired from the placenta to the fetus which could be because of umbilical cord accidents, because of a prolapse, an entanglement or a true knot or because of abnormalities of the umbilical vessels. Now if you consider the manifestations of hypoxia and ischemia together, it more or less comprises of the same factors because hypoxia ischemia is a sequel of perinatal asphyxia. So the same maternal factors of hypertension, hypotension, torch infections, vascular disease, drug exposure will persist. Placental factors such as abnormal placenta, abnormal shape, abnormal position also do have a role along with that other factors such as uterine rupture and cord prolapse as well. If you see the pathophysiology, we classify it into brief asphyxia and prolonged asphyxia. Brief asphyxia is because of a transient increase followed by a subsequent decrease in the heart rate associated with a mild elevation in the blood pressure and increased central venous pressure but constant cardiac output is maintained. And a prolonged asphyxia is because of a loss of pressure autoregulation which may be associated with a carbon dioxide vasoreactivity as well. At a cellular level, the cellular dysfunction occurs because of diminished oxidative phosphorylation and diminished ATP production as a result of which there is accumulation of intracellular components of sodium, chloride, calcium as well as extracellular calcium as well. Cell death might be either immediate or delayed. Immediate cell death is because of necrosis and delayed cell death might be because of apoptosis. If you see necrosis in detail, it's because of a specific intracellular accumulation of sodium calcium accumulation because of the ion pump failure. We all know that the ion pump acts at a cell membrane level. So the ion pump ensures that whatever cations are present intracellularly can go extracellular and extracellular can come intracellular to maintain homeostasis. Apoptosis is secondary to uncontrolled enzyme activation and because of free radical generation and the reperfusion injury also occurs because of generation of free radical reactive oxygen species. We know that generally O2 is present in the form of O2 and is present in a diminished form, diffused form but because of reperfusion injury the free radical oxygen species will be O2 minus. When this O2 minus acts upon the cell it results in a reperfusion injury. Now encephalopathy by definition is abnormal consciousness. It is again subclassified into mild and severe. Now mild encephalopathy will be characterized by jitteriness along with the hyper alert stage. Moderate or severe characterized by 
impaired response to light, touch or noxious stimuli. It will also be associated with brainstem injuries or cranial nerve abnormalities and motor abnormalities such as hypotonia, weakness or abnormal posture. The most common abnormal posture what we see is a decerebrate posture. So the decerebrate posture is what we do see more commonly. Now the classification of HIE can be done based on the Sarnet and Sarnet staging. The, it comprises of three stages, stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. We further subclassified into neuromuscular control and complex reflexes. Now in Sarnet staging, if you consider the first component of neuromuscular control. In stage 1, the muscle tone will be normal. Stage 2, it will progressively move on to hypotonia and stage 3, it will become flaccid. In stage 1, posture will maintain in mild flexion and subsequently will move on towards distal flexion in stage 2 and decerebration in stage 3. The stretcher flexes will be overactive in both stage 1 and stage 2 but in stage 3, it will become absent and myoclonus will be present in both stage 1 and 2 but will become absent in stage 3. So if you do generally observe the neuromuscular activity, it will be present somewhat to a larger degree in stage 1 and stage 2 but by stage 3 it disappears. Now if we do consider the neonatal reflexes which are persistent, the sucking reflex will be weak in stage 1, it will be weak or absent in stage 2 and by stage 3 it becomes totally absent. The morose reflex in stage 1 will be strong because of the hyperactive response. Progressively it will weaken in stage 2 and it will become totally absent in stage 3. Pupillary reflex will be mitriasis or dilation in stage 1 followed by a meiosis or a contraction in stage 2 but variable often unequal in stage 3. Stage 1 will show tachycardia if you check the heart rate. It will show bradycardia in stage 2 but by stage 3 it will become variable and may even become irregular. Secretions will be minimal in stage 1, profuse in stage 2 and variable in stage 3. Now the key point which I want to highlight is stage 1 will not have any seizure activity. So seizures will never be present in stage 1. Stage 2 will have seizures quite commonly which might be either focal or multifocal and it is again very rare in stage 3. The only exception is seizures will be present in decerebration if proven in stage 3. So seizures will not be there in stage 1 but will be present in stage 2 and will again be absent in stage 3. Now this is I think the most characteristic feature to distinguish the three because even if you are not able to remember the whole table in a sequential order you can remember it but seizures is not there in stage 1, it is present in stage 2 and is not there in stage 3. If you consider the EG findings, the findings will be normal in stage 1. By stage 2, there will be early changes in both the delta and the theta wave pattern and seizures, of course, because it is present, there will be focal spikes and early changes will be there in uh, stage 3 also. If you consider the duration, stage 1 will be there within 24 hours, stage 2 for 2 to 14 days and stage 3 can last for weeks together. This is the Sarnet and Starnet staging of HIE. There is one more staging called the Levine staging. In the Levine staging, again we classify it into mild, moderate and severe. Consciousness will be, you, the parameters what we assess include consciousness, tone, seizures, sucking and respiration. In mild, in, under the mild staging, the consciousness will be irritable. Tone will be hypotonic. Seizures will be absent and there is a poor sucking response. Under moderate, Consciousness level will show minimal amount of lethargy with hypotonia that continues but the hypotonia is more marked than in mild stage and seizures will characteristically be present in moderate stage and there is an inability to suck during the uh, moderate stage as well. In a severe stage the patient will be comatose with profound hypotonia and the seizures will be prolonged and often will result in status. So if you do compare the seizures, in mild it is not there, in moderate there is somewhat a degree of seizures which will be present but can result in prolonged seizures in severe uh, under the Levine staging. And respiration itself is uh, unable to be sustained during the uh, severe stage of Levine staging. So if you do see the sequence, 
mild will have variable degree of consciousness which will lead to lethargy which will become comatose the tone will be hypotonia which profoundly goes on increasing the level of seizures in levin staging goes on increasing and a poor suck becomes an unable to inability to suck which results in a unable to sustain a poor uh, respiration itself if you consider the multi organ dysfunction isolated brain involvement will be 15% renal involvement will be seen because of acute tubular necrosis oliguria and a rise in serum creatinine which often goes fivefold cardiac involvement will be seen because of transient myocardial ischemia and pulmonary effects such as Uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension pulmonary hemorrhage and edema also will be present hematological features suggestive of dic will be very common and it is characteristically identified by the d dimer test and hepatic dysfunction along with effects such as even necrotizing enterocolitis may be seen so based on an asphyxia there is a multi system involvement and each system is involved in a different way if you want to evaluate this we will go in a day by day approach on day 1 the basic investigations to be done include a complete blood count urea serum electrolytes liver function test blood glucose level followed by magnesium along with an ebg coagulation profile to monitor the 24 hour urine output as well as do a baseline eeg on day 1 this is the basic evaluation to be done on day 1 workup on day 2 the same investigations to be repeated urea electrolytes blood glucose magnesium calcium 24 hour urine output eeg and a renal ultrasound is indicated if there is an alteration in the renal function and a functional echo also to be done on day 3 urea serum electrolytes and liver function test to be checked along with neuroimaging based on cranial ultrasound and mri this is best done on day 3 now postnatally the treatment which is given is ventilation these babies do require to be ventilated often for a prolonged period and on ventilation the target carbon dioxide is maintained at the normal range oxygenation also is to be maintained at the normal range and hyperoxia is to be avoided and it is important to maintain passive cooling by turning off the warmer lights this is a very important strategy in effectively managing these kids and perfusion to be maintained by cardiovascular stability as well further the physiological metabolic state is to be maintained by correcting hypocalcemia and hypoglycemia if present according to protocol and by ensuring judicious fluid management now as per the neonatal management for seizures the first line drug to be chosen for seizures is phenobarbitone followed by phenytoin followed by benzodiazepines such as midazolam followed by levetiracetam in the same order and management of any other uh, organ injury is to be done according to protocol if identified if renal manifestation is there to be managed accordingly if liver involvement is there to be managed accordingly etc now it's important to consider a neuroprotective strategy therapeutic hypothermia has been shown to decrease the risk of brain injury in newborns where the exposure to perinatal hypoxic ischemic in cells are there now generally we do tend to ensure that thermal regulation is maintained in newborn by ensuring warmth is given but this is a novel strategy where we are ensuring hypothermia that is a reduced in temperature to include under this strategy the gestational age should be more than 36 weeks birth weight to be more than 2 kg and the acute perinatal event should be there as a cause such as an abruption cord prolapse or a severe fetal heart dysregulation by definition the cord blood ph should be less than 7 and the 10 minute apgar score should be less than 5 with assisted ventilation given at 10 minutes so with all these criteria fulfilled you can go ahead for the neuroprotective strategy now i won't go into detail about it but just a few points as an overview temperature core should be maintained and monitored every 15 minutes until 33.5 degrees centigrade is maintained respiratory status is to be checked with an abg cardiovascular system balance to be checked along with adequate fluid balance and maintaining the neurological status with adequate sedation and pain management now after 72 hours to rewarm the child it is to be done gradually at intervals of 0.5 degree centigrade every 2 hours until 36.5 degree centigrade is done and generally this procedure will take 10 to 12 hours as a whole now the outcome of perinatal asphyxia in general is quite poor the mortality results at 20% and the risk of cerebral palsy is 5 to 10% in individuals with birth asphyxia now compared to the general population of 0.2 it is comparatively higher but i would like to stress upon this point that 
most cerebral palsy is not related to perinatal asphyxia and most perinatal asphyxia does not cause cerebral palsy though the most common cause of cerebral palsy is perinatal asphyxia this point is very very important all children who have perinatal asphyxia will not have cerebral palsy and vice versa also the presence of seizures during the newborn time during this perinatal period is indicative of cerebral palsy and it also increases the risk but it is again not definitive and mri is merely prognostic in nature a few mentions about uh, recent advances with regard to the uh, cooling therapy argon therapy is also there xenon therapy is also advancing allopurinol n acetyl cysteine magnesium sulfate vasopressin and erythropoietin all of these therapies are now coming into view with regard to uh, perinatal asphyxia management and cooling therapies and with regard to neurobiomarkers s100b is a calcium binding protein along with neuron specific enolase il6 glial fibrillary acid protein gfap cpkpb brain derived neural factor bdnf myelin basic protein ubiquitin carboxyl terminase terminal hydrolyl term excuse me ubiquitin carboxyl terminal hydrolase l1 and lipid peroxidation products these are all neurobiomarkers which are also recent advances which are under study right now to as predictors for the outcome of hie and of perinatal asphyxia with regard to metabolites the recent advances include arachidonic acid citric acid fumaric acid lactate malate propanoic acid and succinic acid all of them so the, what i'm like what i would like to highlight with regard to the recent advances is apart from hypothermia cooling therapy there are other therapies which are under fold there are also studies happening in neurobiomarkers to ensure a good outcome and to quantify the outcome along with other metabolites to see how the prognosis can be judged on that note i come to the end of this broad overview presentation i will be recording a separate video on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in detail so in that i will go a bit more in detail about the topic but this is just a broad overview to introduce the topic and to understand the various modalities of treatment involved and the various etiologies thank you for listening